the Republican Party in votes. And, and, and Democrats who continue to harp on the issue appear myop, myopic and opportunistic. Why? Because Republicans have already said we're done talking about it. But no one has who's followed this issue closely or even curs cursorily would say that state level abortion related controversies can be quarantined at the respective state level, not before Dobbs and certainly not after. And that was proven true shortly after Trump's remarks when the Arizona Supreme Court found that an 1864 law still on the books banning just about every abortion practice was enforceable. Trump was not able to wash his hands of the subject as he thought he could. Indeed, he was he felt himself compelled to criticize the law, actually kind of heap scorn on the legislature for leaving it in place and then implore the Democratic governor to, quote, bring it back into reason. If nothing else, this episode tells us just how difficult it will be for Democrats or rather Republicans to walk away from abortion as much as they might like to. For more on this, I'm very pleased to be joined by my two guests today, my colleague at National Review, the politics reporter Audrey Falberg, and senior editor at The Dispatch, Mike Warren. Thank you both very much for joining me today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So, Audrey, let's start with you. Uh, you and your colleague, Brittany Bernstein, have a piece up at National Review. Quote, Trump finalizes divorce with the organized pro-life movement. Was that the president's plan all along? Shed what he clearly regards to be some dead weight around the Republican Party in the, pro in the form of the pro-life movement? And how have pro-life activists responded to Donald Trump's shot across their bow? So Donald Trump has spent the entire campaign um, waffling on abortion, not articulating a clear position. Um, you have to remember under his first administration, he helped push Republican efforts to try to pass a 20 week um, federal ban on abortion. Obviously, that was not successful. Um, but yeah, I mean, clearly a lot of pro-life advocates are very frustrated um, by his remarks here. Um, what really interests me is you you mentioned that a lot of Republican operatives, and obviously Trump and in, in his campaign included, uh, are kind of framing this as, you know, by leaving this issue to the states, he can wash his hands of the issue, and it completely neutralizes the issue. Um, I called someone on the Biden campaign, and they couldn't stop laughing when, when I, you know, <laughs> talked about this framing, right? Because... Um, they have a bunch of, you know, they have a bunch of clips of 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 Trump. Even yesterday, he he took credit for overturning Roe, you know, by by helping nominate the, some of these more uh, conservative justices on the court that helped overturn Roe back in 2022. Um, and, and like you said, I mean, he's going to be tied to every single restrictive um, state level law now. Um, they're already running ads um, with, you know, human interest ads with women talking about how they couldn't receive an abortion in their own state. Um, you know, I think back to Kentucky uh, last fall, right? Andy Bashir, vulnerable Democrat, he runs this really effective ad of a 12 year old girl who was raped and who talks about the importance of, you know, being able to seek an abortion, right? Um, a lot of American voters don't like thinking about the issue. It makes them very uncomfortable. Um, they don't, a lot of Americans, if you look at polling, they're not supportive of late term abortions, but also um, they're they're uncomfortable by the overturning of, of Roe v. Wade, right? And so I still- And I Democrats think are uncomfortable with it. They talk about all these margin cases as though that's the norm, the, the, the exceptions that Trump likes to talk about, rape, incest, et cetera. But those are, those are the fringe cases. The vast majority of abortions are first term abortions are elective and they're used as a form of birth control. Yeah. And and the the unfortunate reality is that a lot of Democratic candidates are not going to be asked regularly on the campaign trail by reporters about where, you know, when they would like the cutoff to be. Um, they're not getting those questions. It's, it's an issue that reporters ask Republicans almost ex exclusively about. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is and another thing to think about is. Right. You know, you, you've written extensively about how a lot of these Trump aligned Republicans um, use abortion as a scapegoat for losing elections. Right. When in reality, a lot of the 2022 Senate Republican candidates were already weak, um, bad and broke candidates who um, after the overturning of, of Roe, you know, obviously the decision was leaked a little bit earlier, but I think that was June 2022. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. A couple of months before Election Day, they had no idea how to clearly articulate their positions on the issue. And so they kind of avoided talking about it. So national operatives, Republican operatives this cycle are urging the candidates to get ahead of the issue. It's unclear whether that will actually make a huge difference. Right. Um, you know, when you talk to Democrats, they say this is not a messaging problem for Republicans. It doesn't matter how much they talk about it, that, you know, the 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 it's a it's a policy issue. Um, I'm curious your thoughts, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I, I'm going to get Mike in on this because I'm sure he has thoughts as well. So, Mike, on paper, this makes a lot of sense, Trump's initiative, uh, just because I think most most political strategists would think it's in the Republican Party's interest to hammer out a unified position on abortion, whatever it is, universalize it so that the party isn't at war with itself on this thing. And no one can seem to do that but Trump. He's obviously the center of gravity in the GOP. And yet, because he's reading the stage directions out loud here, making it clear that this has nothing to do with principle, it's purely opportunistic. It is just a way to get through this election cycle and get this thorny issue behind them. It probably irritates more people on the right than it than it satisfies. And it certainly gives Democrats ammunition, no? Yes. I mean, I was thinking about this as the Arizona decision came down, because you got the sense after Donald Trump's remarks the day before, um, you could see it in the response from from Democratic uh, lawmakers and the Biden campaign. Um, they, as as pro lifers, were throwing a fit about uh, their abandonment uh, by Donald Trump. Uh, Democrats were trying to insist that uh, you know just because he didn't endorse a national fifteen uh, week limit mm-hmm. doesn't mean he won't really do it. Um, there was a sense of desperation, I think, among Democrats that they really need this issue. And in that way, Trump is correct um, that that Democrats really want to run on this because um, at the moment, the, as we'll probably talk about later in this hour, uh, the economy is not a, a great uh, message to run on. Joe Biden is not a great uh, candidate to back. So uh, run with uh, what hurts your opponents. And if Donald Trump can neutralize that issue then uh, that takes away a big uh, potential advantage for Democrats. And then, of course, what comes uh, the next day is this Arizona decision. So the abortion issue um, isn't going away for uh, Republicans. And so while I take your point about the issue that that every political strategist uh, would would recommend coming up with a unifying uh, position, Donald Trump, and you can see this, Down the line, just today, Carrie Lake, the uh, Arizona uh, Senate candidate for Republicans who ran for governor in 2022, uh, she came out with a five minute video uh, sort of detailing her own position on abortion in which she's personally opposed, but finds uh, the Supreme Court decision in her state uh, unworkable and outrageous, uh, a sort of long discursive conversation uh, uh, with the camera about uh, about sort of talking about this issue carefully and with compassion. Um, there's There seems to be that unified position is, uh, let's talk about how compassionate uh, we are. We don't want to in- endorse anything on a federal level. Oh, and by the way, we really should be uh, backing more uh, sort of government funding, whether it's through tax credits, whether it's through some kind of sort of right wing big government, uh, uh, sort of a pro natalist policy uh, and a policy that helps people uh, who are having uh, babies and it, look, that's a choice. That's a choice that this the party seems to be making and fits and starts. Uh, the pro life movement is not what it was since uh, Dobbs came down, uh, but it's still somewhat of a force. It does seem to me that, from a political standpoint, one thing that hasn't been tried at least this time around is um, actually embracing uh, some level of um, of of whether it's a national or a sort of generalized idea that uh, some abortions should be uh, limited at a certain point, and then going on the offensive about those things that Audrey was mentioning that Democrats are never asked about, never asked about uh, late-term abortions, What at what point is that line drawn? Um, I'm right, and necessarily... I would think that Trump and even Carrie Lake would be pretty well positioned to thread that needle because they they're not principled pro-lifers. I mean, how how much do you have to know about Donald Trump and Kerry Lake to know? I mean, certainly not Donald Trump. I, I think most people would would understand that he was a bit of a bon vivant, uh, something of a of a ne'er do well in his youth. Um, sure. So perhaps has some skeletons in his closet in that sense. Kerry Lake was knocking on doors for Barack Obama in two thousand eight. So do you have to be really plugged in to know that these these folks are not really down with the pro-life cause, or is it just the fact that they're in the Republican Party and the Republican Party at the legislative level is pursuing these reforms? 
Well, this is this is what I think is the problem is that you have in just those two standard bearers, um, Donald Trump at the national level, Kerry Lake at the state level in Arizona. Um, you have people who are. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, ardent pro-lifers would say that they are fellow travelers, but not uh, uh, not perfectly aligned with their views on this. Um, I think they are bad. Uh, faces for a Republican Party that uh, is still nominally pro-life because uh, they don't come from that tradition. They, I, I think they view it as um, a, maybe a, uh, a position to take for political expediency. And so when they pivot and say, actually, no, 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 we don't want to restrict things on a national level. We actually, we're actually so very close to the center of the country on this. A lot of swing voters just don't believe them. They look at the party that they come from. And so I guess what I'm suggesting here is um, one thing you never hear from the top of the party is Republicans to suggest to themselves, um, maybe we should figure out an abortion restriction position uh, that reflects our party, figure out what that is, be able to speak coherently about it, uh, and then go on the offensive against Democrats for being e extremist. It it has worked in the past. The problem is Republican candidates don't know how to talk about it. They sound like they are either reading from the playbook uh, or they start spouting off in ways that make them sound callous, make them sound like they're ignorant of how women's bodies work. And it's just a disaster. So if they could just fix that problem, Noah, then Republicans would uh, be fine. Just a small little problem there, sure. Um, so, Audrey, to that point, to Mike's point, I mean, Democrats believe that any any time Republicans are talking, at ab uh, talking about abortion in any sense, even if they're trying to thread a very cautious needle, they're winning the day. They don't have to try too hard to get Republicans to talk about abortion anyway at the state level, not just the Arizona case, but a Florida court ruling will put abortion on the ballot in November it demonstrates just how live this issue is. And regardless of how Dem how Republicans talk about it, it's going to redound to the Democratic Party's benefit. At least that's what I think you would hear from Democratic sources. Is that what you're hearing? Um, I think because the Republicans have such a messaging problem, um, that is the general gist. Um, to go off something that Mike was just talking about with respect to Carrie Lake, the problem is, um, you know, clearly she perceives abortion as a losing issue for, for Republicans. She, you know, right after the Supreme Court ruling came out, essentially reviving this 160 year old law, she released this very long statement saying she poses it immediately wants the Democratic governor and state legislature to come up with um, an immediate common sense solution, right? Um, you know, she releases that statement, then all every report reporter's uh, inbox is suddenly flooded with Carrie Lake flip-flops on 19, 1864 abortion law, because when she ran for governor in 2022, she had praised it as a great law, right? Um, so there are these short video clips that are going to redound to Democrats' benefits, I think, in, ter in, in terms of the, the flip-flopping here. Um, you know, you can practically see the ads that are going to run through November with, with Trump, right, where he says, I think the issue should be left to the states. And then they're going to cut to, oh, well, then just you side with the Arizona restrictive law here, even mm -hmm. though he come out against that law, right? They're not going to include that clip in, in the video. Um, so I think that's definitely uh, going to be a big issue. And, for and Noah... I think the biggest takeaway from this is that if abortion is the issue that it is now, and I believe will continue to be for all the reasons that Audrey just laid out in the national conversation, that is the motivation that Democrats have been looking for to get their voters out, so, um, to, to get voters off of the sidelines who are very disappointed at the moment or very unenergized by Joe Biden. So that's the thing. Uh, in 2022, it's not like abortion didn't matter. It did. It generated Democratic turnout. It drove Democratic fundraising. It has since. But there's an effort on the part of the MAGA right in particular to ascribe all of the GOP's shortcomings in the 2022 midterms to the Dobbs decision. And it's just frankly not true. Trump said this at the time. It wasn't my fault. He's he's very clear <laughs> about he's not. There's no nuance to him. It wasn't my fault that the Republicans didn't live up to expectations in the midterms. It was the abortion issue poorly handled by many Republicans, especially those that firmly insisted on no exceptions, even in the cases of rape, incest and the life of the mother that lost large numbers of voters. The, 
I can't shake the feeling that there is an effort here to get some insurance in the event 2024 doesn't go Trump's way. He and his allies have retailed this notion for a long time, and it's not true. As Audrey said, a vast, vastly more evidence suggests that the reason why Republicans lost winnable races, particularly statewide races in 2022, was because they were outside the mainstream, not on abortion, but on the 2020 stolen election narrative. And Trump will not put that up for negotiation. He still makes references to his 2020 victory. Even Laura Trump, the Republican Party co-chair, who told Garrett Hack at NBC News that they were, quote, past that when she asked whether they were going to continue to litigate 2020. She's putting out robocalls now alleging massive fraud in the 2020 election. They are wedded to this narrative, and it's not up for negotiation. So pro-lifers, you're the ones that have to compromise. You're going to have to be thrown under the bus now. Because if we're going to have one real serious you know, deficit here, we're going to lug some you know, millstone around our neck. It's going to be the 2020 election stuff, not your pro-life stuff. Am I, am I just I, being paranoid here or is there more evidence to back up my uh, thesis? Well, you know, look, is there evidence that uh, that Donald Trump and his allies will look for any argument at hand to – uh, to not have to grapple with uh, this fundamental electoral problem that they have, which is that when Donald Trump uh, talks about losing the 2020 election, he loses. <laughs> that <laughs> this is this is. I mean, they, they will they will try to talk about anything but that. So yes, uh, I, I think that's reasonable. It's it's not some grand strategy. It's just right. this is the way that Trump approaches things uh, uh, when 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 the blame game starts to zero in on him and he finds something else and this is a very useful tool i agree with you our my my, my colleague and your former former colleague john mccormick um i think uh outlined this very well how um you can look at state level candidates in 2022 mehmet oz in pennsylvania uh herschel walker in georgia these were two senate candidates in swing right. uh states joe kent in washington sure. joe kent in washington is another good example um did they lose because of abortion, would a, another Republican uh, in that in that place? I think John mentions Pat Toomey, the outgoing Republican senator from Pennsylvania, who Mehmet Oz was running for his position, uh, his seat. Um, Brian Kemp, who won his governor's race, won re-election in 2022. Abortion was an Every issue. Every Florida in Republican, yeah, you can go down the line. Exactly. So, so there's your answer. And and well, will Trump try to make an issue of it and say it wasn't my fault? It was the pro-lifers. The answer is yes. So, Audrey, it can be both, right? It can be an attempt at blame shifting in the event of a loss and also an earnest attempt to shed some weight and, and maybe streamline a path to victory. But it's more one than the other. What What's the percentage you would put it at? Is it more blame shifting or more a genuine attempt to win the election? Um, That's a tough question. Uh, I, I think, know. That's why I, I think. I think that it's probably more an attempt to win the election. I think based on every comment we've seen from, from Donald Trump about abortion, he waffles so much that he it's it's I think it's clear to most voters that this is not an issue that he really cares about, but he understands that a lot of his base Republican voters do. Um so he, but he also is keenly aware of the power that he has over his party. And that even pro-lifers who are super passionate about, um, you know, about about the pro-life cause would prefer him to Joe Biden. And so he thinks, why why not just kind of shed the more extreme um, or excuse me, not extreme, but hardline pro-life um, kind of policy objectives to, to try to, to win this election. Um, you mentioned Mehmet Oz and um, and Herschel Walker. Um, you know, obviously there were a lot of bad candidates last cycle. I think one thing that's important to remember is that a lot of Senate Republican operatives are keenly aware of this dynamic here. Hence, you know, Senate Republican campaign chief Steve Daines, uh, he's putting a huge premium on recruiting what he believes are strong general election candidates. I mean, it's a pretty simple strategy here. You know, last cycle, Rick Scott, he ran the National Republican Senatorial Committee, which is the, the Senate Republican campaign arm um, charged with recruiting and helping Senate Republicans win elections. Um, he ha had a kind of a hands-off approach um, and that led to a lot of, you know, these bad candidates that ended up losing a lot of what otherwise could have been winnable elections. 
Um, Danes is making the bet that by recruiting really wealthy and kind of stronger general election candidates, at least in his mind, you know, who knows what oppo exists on these guys, <laughs> um, that, that, that'll that certainly help this time around. Um, but yeah, we'll see. No, that's true. Uh, got to got to hand it to the NRSC. Good recruitments and a good map this cycle. So if it doesn't bounce their way, there's something really, really wrong here. Um, turning now to Congress, which is back in session, and there is a lot on their plate, but I want to zero in on one particular uh, source of uh, consternation for me, and that's the Senate supplemental that uh, went down in February, it's supposed to fund Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, as well as uh, augment border security. That blew up, but Mike Johnson signaled for weeks now that he's going to take another crack at this thing, and it's coming up very soon. So the new structure of the deal for Ukraine aid, as I understand it, Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to make the loan a structure it as a forgivable no interest loan, which is unique. We haven't really done foreign aid like that this century, but it's not atypical. Uh, it's something that we've done in the past, and it's designed to appease Trump, who floated it in the first place. It will include the Repo Act, which would repossess some Russian assets abroad to fund the thing, and it would force Joe Biden to abandon his backdoor natural gas export ban, the moratorium on new liquid natural gas export terminals. So the climate hawks are freaking out about this, and that's great from my perspective, because if you if you believe, as I believe, that a lot of the very small caucus, very small conference, rather, and the Republican Party that's opposed to Ukraine aid has done so more as a function of negative partisanship than what the bill actually does, or rather Ukraine's cause generally. They they oppose it because they can't stand doing something that their fellow Republican interventionists like. So if you substitute one bad guy, the GOP interventionists, with another bad guy, left-wing climate hawks, seems like a good trade. Do you think that would be enough to satisfy most, not all, but most of the recalcitrant Republicans in the Senate and the House who object to any Ukraine funding whatsoever? Uh, I've got a uh, if you if you believe that, then I've got a bridge in uh, Car Cave to sell you. I mean, like. I I get it. I think there are uh, a lot of hopeful hawks uh, in the in the Republican conference uh, who see it that way. Um, I think it's going to be a hard sell with Democrats as well, um, not just the sort of far left environmentalist Democrats. Um, the White House has essentially said the LNG pause uh, is a non-starter for them. Um, this uh, this proposal. Um, by the way, a, a source of mine on Capitol Hill um, likened the loan aspect of this to the Lend-Lease Act. Um, so uh, pointing out that this is there, there is a precedent for this when it comes to supporting uh, allies or uh, or sort of quasi allies, allies we don't really want to out, out. Well, there's a lend uh, lease support. on the books right now for Ukraine. And we had structured loans like this, for example, to uh, uh, post war setbacks, pact, Poland, yep. uh, like a, a, just a no interest forgivable loan. So it's basically a grant. It's That's just right. we usually just forgive. You know, we don't we don't do all this, uh, you know, rigmarole. We just give out grants these days. But we're going back to the 90s structure. Hey, you know the '90s fashion is back in. Why not? Why not the rest of it as well? Uh, but here's what here's here's my. I really find Mike. I'm going to argue with you. You really think <laughs> that the White House is serious here when it says, "Oh, we're not negotiating on the LNG ban that we just put on the books four months ago." But Joe Biden himself has articulated this logic when he advocated the export of liquid natural gas to to confront Russian energy diplomacy, energy blackmail in Europe. These are assets under sanction. He's really going to stand pat on this one. If it passes the House, it passes the Senate. It's on his desk. He's going to say no Ukraine aid for this liquid natural gas, you know, hey, flight if, of if, fancy. If if this passes the House and passes the Senate, Joe Biden will sign it into law. I don't think it's passing the House uh, or the Senate for that reason. I think there is um, a view among Democrats on Capitol Hill that um, Johnson uh, can't get this through even he can't even get the recalcitrant republicans on board you have this uh this uh, motion to vacate looming over him from marjorie taylor green who knows when she'll pull the trigger and demand that there's a vote on it uh she's been complaining about ukraine funding um and i think democrats view their their talking point as all you have to do speaker johnson is pass 
the bill that the Senate passed, the supplemental that the Senate passed back in February. Um, and they think that uh, he this is just one step in getting to the point where he feels he has no choice but to vote for uh, but to hold a vote on that. He says he doesn't want to. Um, he's throwing these bones to his conference. Um, I don't think the conference is going to accept uh, a victory. And um, at that point, he could be, you know, in real trouble for his own speakership. Um, I'm told that Johnson believes in funding Ukraine and finding a way to fund Ukraine. I think Democrats are calling his bluff on this and saying, uh, you can't pass this proposal of yours. Uh, and if you can, great, we'll sign it, we'll move on. Um, but we've got this other thing in our back pocket. The Senate has already passed a bill. Um, all you have to do is bring it to a vote. Um, there are all those internal reasons why uh, Republicans or that far right wing of uh, the conference uh, doesn't want to let him do that. But it's sort of the, it's the last resort. Um, I think that's what's going to happen. Well, that's depressing. Uh, Audrey, so we talked about, Mike mentioned Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's getting a lot of really undue outsized attention this week for her opposition to this and her effort to put a gun to Mike Johnson's head. He's responding as though he has a gun to his head. But how many Republicans on the op opposition side of this thing are as dogmatic as MTG? The argument from anti-Ukraine Republicans, um, in some cases even before Russia's second invasion of Ukraine, was that the country really wasn't worth saving either due to its corruption or to its position on the periphery of U.S. interests. That's kind of changed now. Now they say committing more support to Ukraine is throwing good money after bad. You can't shield, you know, can't change the battlefield circumstances. Uh, the 2022 successes that Keeve enjoyed notwithstanding. This all strikes me as a conviction in search of a supporting rationale, but how firm is the conviction? Is it such that it, the enough Republicans will die in defense of cutting Ukraine off to paralyze the House? I think you're right that uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is getting some undue attention on Capitol Hill, but that's what you get with this very narrow House GOP majority that seems to be shrinking by the day with uh, more and more resignations that we, that we continue to get. Um, yeah, so to catch people up before um, the Easter recess, she fi she sent this signaled this that she uh, is open to a motion to vacate. She sent a five page long dear colleague letter. Um, you know, saying that Ukraine is essentially not a, a priority for for the House GOP. Um, I think it's it remains to be seen whether she can, who else is going to get on board with this. The House is actually voting right now. So, you know, maybe we'll get an update in, in a matter of minutes here. Um, but I think there it, frustration with Johnson's leadership. I think Mike Mike is right that um, funding Ukraine is a priority for him. I think that um, there is some frustration with Johnson's leadership, not just among the more hardline conservatives, but some of the more um, kind of Republican study committee aligned um, GO GOP uh, members who are, you know, can be convinced to, to fund Ukraine, but are also eager for some red meat to throw at the base and really do want um, to have a, a border bill that, you know, gets on Joe Biden's desk, right? Um, and so I think there are, there are a lot of House Republicans who think that Johnson's a little out of his depth here in terms of negotiating uh, negotiating this this supplemental. Um, I was talking to a, a House Republican earlier today who said that behind closed doors, some of the more hawkish uh, House Republicans are saying, if you're going to go down, then uh, funding Ukraine is a good way to go down and you'll be remembered well in the history books. Um, and so those are the kind of frank conversations that are really going on behind the scenes here. Yeah, I mean, I've said this on previous episodes of this thing, but I just the pressure is is so light on Republicans who regard their position in posterity as being threatened by their position on Ukraine because in, 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 posterity will not remember Marjorie Taylor Greene. They will remember Joe Biden. And if Ukraine collapses under his watch, it will be his failure. And I bet that's probably a lot of that's a big temptation for Republicans, at least those who are um, politically savvy enough to recognize that. Mike, we've been talking a lot about Republicans. What about the Democrats here? We had this report in the Wall Street Journal that upwards of 20 Democrats in the House were prepared to bulk at this too, not because of Ukraine, but because of Israel aid. Um, they, we've seen a fair amount of hostility to Israel's cause from uh, Democrats and progressives. It's only getting more intense and 
it, let's say Republicans somehow managed to find a path to 217 in their conference. I kind of doubt it. They would need, obviously, some Democratic votes. But Democrats have to worry about the integrity of their own caucus. Yeah, I mean, if their if their leadership would force some of them to to you know put pen to put their names on this thing, they would resent it, and they would show just as much dysfunction as the GOP, or, or at least a a similar amount, maybe not exactly the same. Yeah, the the good thing though for for those House Democrats is they're in the minority still, and in the minority <laughs> you can kind of do for now what you want <laughs> for now. now. I I know. Well, hold on. Let's uh, let me double check on Twitter to make sure there uh, you know haven't been three deaths in the Republican conference, and now the Democrats have the majority. But uh, I'm interrupting you. But there was this talk. I mean, some some Republican I forget who yeah, said, "Well, bring on the motion to vacate." What's that going to yield except Speaker Hakeem Jeffries? Well, you know, this is interesting, actually, and and it's not going to be exactly answerable to your question about the Democrats, but I do think that there is some frustration in the center of the conferences, particularly on the Republican side. Um, They were willing to go to bat for Mike Johnson when he was eventually emerged as the uh, successor who had the votes uh, to uh, succeed Kevin McCarthy uh, last fall. they were willing to go along with him. I think there is a little less uh, patience with Mike Johnson at this point. Um, and uh, I think there is a sort of a willingness to consider what the Democrats have to offer. It's crazy to think about. Could there be some kind of center left with some center right you know, people in a coalition uh, to finish out the year with a Speaker Jeffries. It sounds crazy until it doesn't. So, um, I mean, we'll just have to see how well Johnson can play it. Um, I've even also heard the idea that if Johnson makes a really, um, uh, a, a really earnest effort and good faith effort to find some way and twist enough arms to get some Ukraine funding, that if Marjorie Taylor Greene pulls the motion to vacate, MTG pulls the MTV, uh, then maybe there would be enough Democrats who would reward Mike Johnson uh, on that vote, not by voting for him for speaker, they would never do that, but maybe by choosing not to come to the floor and vote, uh, lowering the threshold and allowing enough Republicans to uh, quash that uh, that uh, vacation, uh, the, the motion to vacate the chair. Uh, it's Whatever precedents we have, iron laws of how Congress should work, uh, throw them out the window because uh, it's all it's all new now. I think a problem there, though, is um, any Republican speaker who depends on Democratic support to keep his job is going to have some struggle fundraising and keeping the goodwill of the rightmost flank, even as you said, they. It, it it doesn't necessarily require them coming on the floor and voting f- in favor of him, right? Um, but yeah, that's it. I mean, that what you're describing there, Audrey, is difficult to message. It's not it's not as easy as Democrats saved Mike Johnson. It's Democrats declined to not let Republicans kill Mike Johnson. It's just kind of a passive. I, I it's mean, so we, passive on their part. We heard so much about how it was Democrats who ousted Kevin McCarthy because Matt Gates's motion to vacate only had eight vote Republican votes and all the rest were Democrats. Right. I mean, partisans are going to partisan no matter what. So sure. uh, I think I agree with you. No, it's harder to message that. So Mike Johnson's heading down, speaking of election uh, fraud and election denialism, Mike Johnson's heading down to Florida is going to apparently appear alongside Donald Trump and talk about the need for election integrity Um, which uh, could be very banal and probably will be, but it'll be coded with all sorts of 2020 denialism, I'm I'm sure of it. But when it comes to Ukraine, Donald Trump has maintained a really practiced ambiguity regarding his views on the utility of providing more support for Ukraine. Audrey, do you have any sense from your reporting of what his true, true views are, if he has them at all, and if he's willing to influence the decision making around this, whatever his verdict is, would be the last word on it. Um, I'm not sure that this is a major prior- campaign priority of his. You're right that it, his position has been deliberately um, ambiguous. I think that's probably because he wants to see how the situation ends up playing out. It's still we still got a long way until November. Right. So he doesn't want to be tied to, I think, 
a particular position now. Um, you talk about, uh, you know, how Trump's position on the issue might affect Speaker Johnson. I think the problem for Johnson is that Trump is not doesn't really care about Speaker Johnson's political future. Um, but he again, he's even who like, does he care about? Save his own <laughs> one person's. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure that he's going to make that private plea um, I, to, to to Trump when, when he sees him. Um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, after he sees him, if Trump comes out with some statement, you know, talking about how great Speaker Johnson is, because I think so many re sitting House Republicans are so uh, concerned with their own reelection prospects and not getting under Trump's ire. Because, I mean, you know, when as you referenced earlier with Lindsey Graham disagreeing with him on abortion, then you get a you know, a 8,000 word true social post bashing Lindsey Graham. Um, but just one more note on, on Speaker Johnson. I think that one um, political dynamic here that um, redounds to his benefit is the reality that McCarthy was ousted um, very, very recently. That's still seared into Republican House Republicans minds. I think, you know, if Mike Johnson can't do it, then then who can? Who's next? Um, you know, I remember reporting on this in October and it took it, it, Yes. People settled on Mike Johnson because he was seen as, you know, a very affable, you know, kind person interpersonally, a strong conservative and an ally of uh, some, somebody who could be kind of an ally of the, the centrist part of the conference and, you know, the hard right wing. But also there was this real sense of fatigue. We got to just settle on somebody. And so I think, you know, that's an, an open question that people are certainly thinking about. You know, if this guy can't do it, who, who else are we going to end up with? Last one on this topic to you, Mike. Um, so. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has sort of devoted what remains of his political career to, in his own words, uh, trying to correct the Republican Party's isolationist tendencies when a Democrat is in the White House. And he's been very vocal in support of efforts to fund our embattled allies abroad, Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Um, I detect nothing in the way of that campaign having any influence or effect over the fellow Republicans in the Senate conference or the House conference. His influence has just been so profoundly diminished over the course of the last 18 months. Really hasn't been that long since he was, you know, just something of a, of a lodestar for the Republican Party. And just the air has just evacuated that balloon with a significant alacrity. Are you seeing more influence from this campaign? Is it bearing any fruit? among Republicans, or is he just barking at the moon? There are a lot of people in the Senate on the Republican side who are not the loudest, who are not the the, the sort of most attention-seeking, um, who consider themselves McConnell acolytes, who sort of learned at the feet of, uh, of the great uh, Mitch McConnell and how the Senate works, um, these are people who very well could be uh, longtime leaders in the Republican conference in the Senate. Um, I, I wonder if uh, if what you're sensing, Noah, is um, is the ranks of that sort of non-interventionism uh, caucus within the Republican conference growing. It, it does have more people in it. Um, but they are also loud. They are also uh, vocal. I'm thinking of, uh, in particular, J.D. Vance has sort of made this, uh, you know, his issue. Um, and he's he's a media savvy guy. Um, and he is uh, a very, very uh, outspoken about this. I think McConnell still has a lot of children. I think the word is out, out <laughs> Fair enough. He I mean, a lot, you know, but he tweets through it. It's 2024, you know, that's that's the that's the that's the way we are outspoken these days. But I think McConnell has a lot of children in the in the Republican conference. I think it's going to be more difficult, particularly when he's gone. Um, there's this jockeying going on for who's going to be the next leader, um, you know, whether it will be uh, John Cornyn or uh, John Thune um, or, or, either, somebody. or somebody else. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it will be named John, though. Yeah, that, that, that that's uh, in the bylaws for the Senate Republican <laughs> Conference must be named John. Uh, is, is are either of those going to be uh, staunch anti-interventionists? Um, I would say that what I know about them, what I followed in their careers, the answer would be no. But they're also going to be uh, kind of beholden to their conference. Um, I think the question you're asking here has yet to be tested. If there is fruit from what McConnell's been doing, we may not see it now. Um, 
let me let me get back to you on that when there is a fight, when there's an election uh, for majority or I should say Republican leader uh, on uh, the Senate side, then um, then we will know whether it has uh, borne any fruit. Fair enough. So uh, I'm off to our third and final topic of this show. Um, we've been talking a lot about Republicans. Let's talk about Joe Biden and his party because they're they're in just as bad straits. Um, we got some pretty rough news for the White House this week from the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the latest Consumer Price Index report. The prices in March went up on average, signaling that the economy is still running really hot. Inflation is not behind us, despite high interest rates. And the news was an indication, I think one that has been a long time coming, that uh, people outside the financial industry have been very resistant to, which is the idea that the Fed will just not be able to reduce interest rates. They've been signaling rate uh, reductions uh, in the minutes of just about every meeting for, I think, the better part of a year now. And the notion that we are going to have a rate cut, um, which would imperil the so-called soft landing that Democrats believed was all but upon us, seems pretty far-fetched at this point. So my uh, my two way colleague, Mark Halperin, along with the pollsters at WIC Insights, focus grouped some undecided voters recently. And when it comes to the economy, their impressions should make Democrats super nervous. Um, many of them cited the downstream effects of inflation as their foremost concerns, not inflation itself, not just the high prices that are directly attributable to inflation, but the pain associated with the instruments you need to bring inflation in line, like high interest rates, high borrowing costs in particular, uh, housing market, all that stuff is really just dragging on them, and they can't really put their finger on it. Um, Audrey, uh, these voters blame Joe Biden for their economic circumstances, that much they know. But it's really hard to see what the president can do at this point to assuage their concerns. Um, Joe Biden's former chief of staff, Ron Klain, is caught on a hot mic recently, and he's saying, why is Joe Biden spending all this time talking about bridges? Bridges are boring. Stop talking about the bridges. Start talking about the economy. They want him to talk about the economy. Mm -hmm. But what's he going to do? That cake is so baked. Even if the Fed were to bring interest rates in a line, which is like unlikely now, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have any effect any appreciable effect before the summer, at which point all of voters' impressions about the economy are pretty well baked in. What's Joe Biden to do? He can't talk about the economy. He has to ignore it. Anything he says will remind voters of why they dislike Biden so much. <laughs> and if you uh, bring this question to Biden campaign staffers, um, you know, what is his economic messaging going to look like? They'll say, oh, well, we ran some ads on this in the fall. And Oh, their, their biggest point is to talk about the lowering of prescription drug prices. The number of times I heard that from Democrats the day of the State of the Union um, was, you know, a million times. Right. So you're you're exactly right. They don't know how to message this. Obviously, when they tried to talk about Bidenomics, that became a perfect line for for Republicans to to kind of kind of hit them. And it, no House Democrat has used the That's term the Biden stupidest Biden. thing that I mean, among the many stupid things that Joe Biden has done in his term in office, branding an economy that everybody hates with your own name is a really stupid thing to do. It was obviously stupid at the time. Yeah. And yet they continue to pursue it even after it was obviously exposed as stupid. Yeah. And so Sorry, that's just, why a, through, just a source of frustration there. <laughs> through November, they're going to just keep on hitting Republicans and Trump in particular on abortion. Um, that is just going to be we've known this for for since the overturning of Dobbs, this is they think that this is their winning issue. They're going to keep focusing on it. Um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, where he's at right now. So what the, Mike, when these um, undecided voters, they express their belief that Biden is to blame. Right. But they can't exactly put their finger on why. So they don't they don't cite, for example, why inflation increased so significantly, so rapidly under his watch. They don't reference the American Rescue Plan, the Infrastructure Act, the Inflation Reduction Act of all things, which should probably come redound to this White House's, uh, not to this White House's benefit at this point. But they, they just have a vague, neb nebulous idea of what is basically experiential. They've experienced this bad economy and they know it happened under Joe Biden's watch and that's that. And Democrats have been trying to argue voters out of their own experience for a while look at the data they say look at all these macro statistics but now the data doesn't match their sentiment so they can't even try to argue voters out of their impressions looking at the data they've been robbed of their last and final you know safe redoubt here 
Yes, they have, um, which maybe suggests they should stop trying. Um, <laughs> and if, if for no other reason, then there's there's not much that the Biden camp, there's really nothing the Biden campaign can do at this point on April, uh, in April 2024, um, to message their way out of this. Um, that being said, um, there are indications that even with this sort of inflation still high or you know still still hot uh report um there is there are indications in fact that uh things are well certainly not as bad as they were at the peak of inflation what that was sort of spring and summer of 2022 uh when when inflation you know the C, the CPI was something like 9% um and it, it's it's still low and if you can see some of this in some of the macro polling, where you, look, polling is garbage this time around, it's really hard to know exactly where things are. Uh-oh. There are That's, some. This in- is a problem, Mike, because my next question is on polling. Well, it's well, then, then, then I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna jump ahead of you know and just say, no, no, no. there Please. is polling, there is polling that indicates that uh, the 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 presidential race is tightening a little bit, and I would say that. Um, People are probably confused. They have this sort of like uh, there's a lingering sense that the economy is maybe worse than it is. And I don't mean to downplay, uh, again, that inflation is is hot, but I think it's not as hot as it uh, as it maybe appears. You're, you're seeing actually prices on the kind of everyday goods that people buy, groceries, um, certain uh, household goods. Uh, th- those prices are actually down. Um, I do wonder if in down months, or just not growing as slowly. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I should yeah, say yeah. I should inflation say that. is sorry. cumulative. We've been living with this for two years, and if it's only growing at 0.2 percent, it it doesn't really matter if it was growing at 10 percent over the last two years. Correct. The the the, the price growth is negative uh, at, at this point. So again, this is not great, but I do wonder if there is. Um, uh, if there is a little bit of sense that the economy is just on its way to that soft landing the Democrats hope for, what what Biden can do between now and then is really nothing. He's just got to wait and hope that things seem not as bad as they as they did. That's his best economic message at this point. Um, I sympathize with Ron Klain. Um, bridges are boring. Um, I don't just don't know what else Biden can say, and certainly what the Biden administration can do between now and then. Um, it's a, it's all about perception, and they're just losing that perception game. Uh, whether or not that's fair, I think it's mostly fair, but uh, but I think there's also some hope on the, ori- on the horizon. They've just got to oh, wait for it. I, I, Audrey, Mike's, Mike's actually right. So we do focus a lot on undecided voters, as, as we obviously should. They're the margin maker, the majority makers, uh, and they're going to determine who the next president is or the next Congress and the next Senate. Um, but they're low propensity voters, especially if they're disinclined to make a decision this far out. They may just simply wash their hands of it. Partisans, however, do come out and vote. And you need your side to be enthused. and You need the other guy's side to be unenthusiastic. And we have seen some in, some suggestion in polling. It is polling. We'll leave that out there. But nevertheless, um, there's some indication that voters are beginning to look on this economy as though it's less of a travesty than it was in 2021, 22, and even 23. Um, people say their personal finances are improving, close to a majority in the last survey that I saw. Consumer sentiment is on the rise. Many believe the economy isn't as bad as it was. Uh, and and may and when they look ahead to the future, they see more say uh, it will be positive. The economy will be positive than say it will be negative. Um, and that's that's a reversal from 2022 trends, 2023 trends. It's not necessarily a reason for Democrats to celebrate. Right. They have a lot of work to do, but you might call it breathing room. So does the CPI report, Audrey, break that trend? Does all Do all of a sudden voters say, oh, you know, all my, it was all a false dawn. My optimism was misplaced. I sacrificed all of it. Or did the, does the CPI just brush past them like you would think it would because voters or Democrats are contis- consistently haranguing voters to look at the data and they just don't. So why would they look at this CPI report and change all their, their opinions? Um, I think that ge- broadly speaking, um, it's, we got to wait to see what the economy looks like over the summer. That's when um, way more Americans are going to be actually paying attention to the presidential election. I had a college friend who asked me a couple months ago if there was a presidential election this cycle, which um, there you go. Of, 
kind of alarming. But so I've been sending her some, some more. I some hope more she studied out her, out her by name, Audrey. Oh. Come on, this is this is. <laughs> I can't, I can't do that. Shamed. <laughs> um. So you know, I I think. I think the economy clearly is not a winning issue for Biden. Um, maybe it's it's consumer sentiment. It, polls do suggest that consumer sentiment is improving a little bit, uh, but still, I think another big concern for for Biden is you know a lot of these minority male voters, like Black and Hispanic men. Polls suggest that Biden is hemorrhaging a lot of support for them. I asked Jamal Bowman, he's a Black progressive from New York, about this a couple a couple months ago, and he said, you know, a lot of voters in my district, a lot of Black male voters feel like Biden, they, they can't feel Bidenomics in their po pocket quite yet. Um, so you talked about the the bridges. That is a good point. You know, Biden is really frustrated that he thinks Americans don't um, understand how much he's done to, to bring infrastructure to their states and districts. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's hard to... to He's clearly out of step with what a lot of Americans are feeling. I think, um, you know, some, something, else, something else to watch over the next couple months is to see how much Biden is actually doing the, the grip and grin on the trail. Um, you know, Trump loves the big rally. Um, he can talk for an hour and a half on end. Um, you know, it, crazy comments abound, but that's baked in with a lot of voters. Whereas with Biden, you know, he's he's not doing a lot of sit down reporter interviews um, very often, I think that, you know, he has the incentive to to continue not doing that. I mean, clearly his campaign decided that doing a Super Bowl interview wouldn't be a good idea um, because his campaign doesn't really trust him to not make some verbal gaffes. Um, so that'll be uh, that'll be interesting to watch as this heats up. You know, Trump is his campaign um, is going to demand debates with Biden, um, even though Trump did not participate in any GOP primary debates. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait to see uh, whether those actually happen and where the, the Biden campaign lands on that. Okay, last one on this one, Mike, and Audrey, you can talk about it too, because uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on it. It's a bizarre phenomenon, and I don't actually know if it matters, probably doesn't. But Gallup has this came out with this poll this week. It's a says that found that 85% of respondents, huge number, are satisfied with their quote personal lives in the United States. Same survey found 17% in that poll expressed. Um, no satisfaction with the direction in which the country is headed. They see that most say the country's on the wrong track. So there's this real dissonance here, and you can see it really in a lot of different areas, particularly in, in polling. Like voters really like their state governments, but they hate how the federal government is run. They like their congressperson, but they hate everybody else's congressperson. And depending on the poll, more than half at times, or at least half, but sometimes closer to 60%, I'll say they're happy with their personal finances, but they say the economy's a disaster. So I'm pretty sure everybody else, they think everybody else in this country is miserable and suffering, but they're not, at least insofar as they're being honest with pollsters. So the perception gap here is very interesting. As a voting matter, I mean, perception trumps everything else, right? It would trump uh, your own personal assessment, you go into the voting booth and say, well, I'm voting for you know the state of the country rather than necessarily my own personal sense of satisfaction. But if you're looking for a morning in America narrative, Mike, it's at the individual level, whereas Trump's narrative is a much more 30,000 foot state national perspective. Yeah. And, you know, there's something poetic about the fact that everybody seems not everybody, a lot of Americans, most of the Americans, vast, vast majority, vast yeah. majority of Americans uh, seem content with their personal lives, miserable with the state of the country and the sort of public sphere. Um, and and here we are with a presidential election between uh, two exceedingly unpopular uh, candidates. In fact, the same ones we were voting on four years earlier uh there's Don't just something po there's something poetic about that there's there, there there's something about uh our discontent with uh these choices and with the way things are and and yet our personal satisfaction i can't quite suss out what what it means um but i do think that if you want to kind of try to figure out some cold hard well what what will this mean for who will win the presidential election, um, I think that is in all uh, everything else static. I think that's a good sign for Biden um, because the partisans will do what the partisans will do. Republicans will vote for Donald Trump no matter what, no matter how they feel about their personal lives. Um, Democrats the same way for Biden. 
Um, it's all about the margins. It's all about that swing oh, voter. I, I said this on Twitter, this very observation in a much smaller and more succinct way. And I got, you know, the, the, the usual reaction, which is, are you a democratic plant? Right. Why would how why would you be saying that? You know, has, we are angling nothing, for some has, kind of a house conservative job on CNN. If you're not if you're not retailing miserable news and misery, you're perceived to be on the other side by at least as you said the partisans. True, true. But look, I mean, I think that that um, the 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 fact is is that incumbency is powerful and uh, it's a powerful uh, thing. I think Biden's biggest problem the, the the reason why even the incumbency might not save him is just the perception as you were saying perception is everything the perception that he is incapable of doing the job and that's an age thing that has nothing to do with uh the the you know what he's done or what he hasn't done in Washington on the world stage none of that matters i think there was a, some polling that indicated everybody had these low opinions of joe biden's uh, uh, you know, appro- the, the low approval of him on all these different issues. And what it really reflected was they have a low opinion of him and his ability uh, okay. to do the job of the presidency because they can see that he's uh, an 80 year old man um, who walks slowly and appears uh, to have lost a step since he's been on the public uh, stage for the last 40 years. Um, all that being said, though, it seems like if apathy about the public, about our our sort of public uh, life, uh, is, uh, is is sort of the the where people are, um, that just redounds to the benefit of the incumbent. Um, and uh, and and if you had to, you know, gun to my head, that's how I think that shakes out in the presidential race. Audrey, what's your perception here, or rather, what's your view here? Is the personal, the concrete? Um, going to be more relevant in the voting booth in November or the the, pers- the broad 30,000 foot perspe- perception of the state of affairs? I think I, I broadly agree with, with what Mike said. And I think that the age issue is the biggest concern for Democrats. You have this kind of strange behind the scenes dissonance where Ron Klain, who knows, by saying those remarks, did he want those remarks to get leaked? Maybe, yeah. probably. <laughs> Right. Um, So you have a lot of Democrats behind the scenes, like uh, leaking stuff to reporters that they really hope will, you know, give advice to the Biden campaign. Oh, Biden's got to do the grip and grin. He's got to be on the trail more. Um, But then you obviously have his own aides who are, um, you know, probably behind the scenes um, concerned that if he does do that grip and grin and maybe he has a huge fall and then that becomes the narrative for the next two months. Right. Um, you know, he got a lot of flack for for doing the basement campaign in, during COVID, but um, he won. So, you know, maybe we'll see some of the same thing in the final months of 4 November. We will see. We're out of time. Thank you both for joining me. Uh, you have been watching Issues with Noah Rothman on Two Way. You can find me, as always, on nationalreview.com or on Twitter, X, at Noah C. Rothman. I really appreciate both of my guests joining me today. Audrey Fallberg, you can read her at National Review. Follow her on Twitter, X, at Audrey Fallberg. And Mike Warren, you can read him and should read him at The Dispatch. He's at Michael R. Warren. And as always, thank you to all of you for joining us, for watching, for listening. I really appreciate it. And we will see you next week.